Morning. That's two of you, so I'm glad to see some stayed awake through the songs. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Yes, bye. Matthew 15. Again, I want to thank, uh, wish all of you a happy Father's Day. Uh, I think it's a, a good thing being a father. I don't need a day, I need a year of being honored. Um, so, what? Take it, yeah, I know. Take it or leave it. I'm waiting for a stroller to get out of here. You can walk faster, Owen. I know you can. <laughs> it's good that he's mine, right? Anyway, we're in Matthew chapter 15. We started this morning talking about what was going on in verses 1 and 2 and dealing with the Pharisees and their hunt for Jesus. And that's what it comes down to in verse 1. They had gone about 70 miles from Jerusalem to come to Gennesaret to ask Jesus a question. Now, I don't know if any, how many of you would walk 70 miles to ask Jesus one question, what would it be? Just kind of think for a minute. If you could ask Jesus one question and get a direct answer, what would you ask him? I don't think any of you would ask him, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? Is that on top of your list? Are you kind of concerned about washing hands and eating bread? This is what made, and I said this in the first class, this is what made a Pharisee a Pharisee. They held the traditions of their understanding higher than the law. And they even used the word that basically God had used for breaking of the law. And they said, you've transgressed, your disciples have transgressed that by not washing their hands. I, I, I really find a lot of humor in Scripture. Maybe it's just who I am as a person, but I don't know who was the bathroom monitor checking the disciples to see if they scrubbed in before eating. I don't know who even said anything to them. They'd have to be, listen, this is important. These Pharisees had to be following them for some time saying, oh, they're eating, but they haven't stopped down at a creek and washed their hands up to the elbow. They haven't done anything. They just, they're just eating. Um. And I personally am okay with that. You know, that's your issues. I've seen kids eat mud. There's no need to wash their hands before that deal, you know. But these disciples, were I mean, these Pharisees were very, very much about the oral transmissions of the law, and they, they held that to the highest esteem, which is problematic. Because that's what's happening between verses 2 and 3. Verse 3, Jesus says, And he answered and said to them, now, here's a, a kind of a tricky thing Jesus does constantly. He's never answering directly the question. He's always answering the question with either another question or answering the heart of the matter, not the matter itself. Because he never says, this is why they don't do it. He says, and why do you? So he's now turning a really good Jewish thing to do is take a question and turn it into a question. You ever try that? Right, it's kind of fun. He says, why do you, why do you, very emphatically to them, why do you yourselves transgress the commandments of God because of the sake of your trans, ter, uh, traditions? Why are you breaking God's law for your traditions? Now, here's what happens. Jesus doesn't answer their question because he didn't want to validate the question. It was not, it had zero to do with anything. All they're trying to do, remember, is entrap Jesus in something so they can convict him and put him to death. Secondly, what the Lord does, he gets to the root of the problem because there's horrible fruit on these trees. Remember what John the Baptist said earlier in the book, uh, here in the book of Matthew. He said, you haven't produced fruit of repentance. You haven't, you haven't done anything with God's word. You're, you're just weird people, dealing with things that are irrelevant just so you can say, look at us. That's all it was about. Look what we do. And they were fancy dressers. They stood out in public. They wanted the authority that was given to them. They loved the power. And they knew if Jesus was who we really claimed to be, <laughs> they would never be empowered. You know what Jesus does? 
He uses Scripture. That's a really good thing, isn't it? Go back with you in Matthew chapter 4. I want you to see something. Matthew, Hold your finger in 15. We're coming right back. And this is what Jesus lived by, and this is us, important for us to grasp this more than anything. Because there is a place that we have to understand the, the utmost and the highest esteem that Jesus held for the Word of God. Now remember, what Jesus has is the Old Testament. Are you with me? He didn't, he didn't carry around, a, what, remember those little pocket New Testaments with Psalms? He didn't carry one of those around. He didn't have that. So he says this, and let's just go to verse 3, Matthew 4, 3. And the tempter came and said to him, this is Satan, since you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. That's easy, because later Jesus will take, well, before, we already looked in the feeding of 5,000, but in, hopefully this morning we'll get to the feeding of 4,000. He takes a few loaves and turns them into bushels of bread. So Jesus can turn stones into bread. It's easy. But notice how he answers him in verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the importance Jesus held to the word of God was because it was out of the mouth of God. What the Pharisees are holding to is the word of God out of the mouth of men, which isn't really the word of God. It's man's understanding of the word. And when you get man's understanding of the Bible without seeing what the Bible says, that's called eisegesis. I know I just threw a big word out, so it's Father's Day. I'm going to explain a word to you. Eisegesis is taking something you want and shoving it into the Bible and make it say what you want it to say. Can you do that? Well, you can do that, but it's improper understanding of Scripture. We want to go to Scripture and see what it says and pull it out of Scripture, so we do exegesis. We say, this is what the Word of God says. So they're making the Word of God say something the Word of God never addresses. You know, the Word of God never addresses, ready for this? How you wash your hands. I know that just floored most of you. You said, really? I thought that was so spiritual, having clean hands. You know, I, everybody's got different kind of hands. And when I worked outside a lot, my hands were kind I couldn't get stuff off. I've tried certain things and it just wouldn't come off. So I kind of walked around, you know, hands in pockets kind of things because you can't get certain off. If you're a fisherman, you can't get the stench off your fingers sometimes from fish. If you're a mechanic, you can't get the grease off. All these different issues we have. So when you wash your hands, you may not look as clean as you think they are, right? But God never addresses that. Why? How important is washing your hands to God's biblical understanding for you to have a good life as a believer? Where is it up there? It's not there. It's, it's not even of any real significant importance, but here's what the Pharisees did. They elevated that. And I think that's really important for us to see because what Jesus does is take the Word of God and say, here's what you've done with the Word of God. So here's the first condemnation he gives them in Matthew 15, verse 3. He says, you transgress God's commandment. I'm going to paraphrase it. In other words, this is a, a, a bushism. I don't know if you can call it that. You're, so, you're the worst kind of evil sinner there is because you make unwritten laws and abide by those putting a yoke of bondage on the people, and the, that law becomes greater than the law God gave you. You understand what he's saying to them? And you readily break what God has said in stone, basically, because that's where the Ten Commandments started, right? In stone. It's written in stone. Therefore, these guys were guilty before the very court of God. And, and I know your translation is probably safe to use in the New American Standard. At the end of verse 3, it says, for the sake of your tradition. It doesn't say that. I know this is hair splitting. It says, because of that. Because of your, trans, uh, of your traditions, you elevate that higher than the Word of God. I have a question for you. Do you think the church has done that today? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say something. I've been in churches since I've been 11, and some of the things that come out of people's mouths, what? How about this? I don't know if this is number one. I'm not a poll guy. You know, but I will say this, this is what I've heard a lot. These are things. We've never done it that way here before. 
Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Do you understand? Uh, I had a Sunday school class of about 30 teenagers once, and I said, you know, it's a beautiful day. Get your chairs. We're going outside. And one of the kids says, we can't do that. You can't do what? You can't have a Bible study outside, or you can't pick up your chair. I couldn't figure that out. What he was basically reflecting was that we've never done that before. Here's another one. Ready for this? If we don't partake of the Lord's Supper, we're in sin, and we may lose our salvation. Where's that? Where's that? I always say this. We should do the Lord's Supper. We should always be in remembrance of Jesus all the time, what he's done before going to the cross and what he's going to do by coming again. We could do that, and we don't have to have a cup of wine and a piece of bread. Now you may show up for Lord's Supper. Just check to see if we're having wine. But see what I'm saying is people make a tradition. What kind of wine should you? What's your serving grape juice? You can't do that. People will say we're not right with God if we don't do and fill in the blank. Find out what it is. Find out what it is. They said these will go on and on and on forever. I've been called in the, in the past. Do you have a nursery? I, yes, I said, yes, we do. Can I drop my kid off and go somewhere else? <laughs> what? The reason I'm saying that is because people look at church as a certain thing to help them get through life physically. Where's the spiritual needs? And this has developed through the years. This is a tradition that church does, and church will cater to certain things. You know, I'm, an, I'm the uh, guy with the little red schoolhouse kind of effect. Everybody should be in here all the time. We got kids out there now, and that's a blessing because they're not going to eat goldfish and smash it in the floor, whatever they might do. So it gives us the time to learn and reflect as they're being taught. But there's no reason we can't all be together at any point. But that's, again, what Jesus is saying, though, this is important. Jesus is casting a judgment upon them because they've elevated their tradition to, the play, to replace the Word of God. Not alongside it, not even below it, but above it and basically removing what the Word of God says. And he goes even further. He's saying, I've got proof of your condemnation. Here's what you've done. And you've got to hear this. This is, this is great. You know, when you read verse 4, it, it's, it says, for God said, so he goes right to the Ten Commandments. And this, this commandment is the first one between man and man. The first couple of commandments are between God and man. You don't have no other God before you, that kind of idea. Well, I'm a jealous God. Those are God to man. But, you know, what's important? Well, today's funny that this occurred. It's Father's Day, and the Bible says, Honor your mother and father. And, and who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. What? Now, I don't know if it would change society, and I don't know if Israel ever practiced it, so please understand this. But just the threat is really good. First time Sam started teaching in elementary school, I said, know what you need to do? Do a chalk outline of the kid in front of your desk on the floor. And say, that was kid was from last year's class. <laughs> I think it may change the kid's demeanor, knowing that we could die if we don't behave. Just the threat is really good. And, and society had an ability to threaten their kids with death if they didn't obey their parents. Just think about that for a minute. You know who runs the families today? I've seen it. You've seen it. Have you been in the stores lately? Johnny runs the family. Little Johnny. And if little Johnny cries hard enough, the little Johnny gets the grapes or whatever he is. Who's in charge? See, the honor was to make sure parents were in charge. However, here's what the Pharisees did. And the Pharisees are really good. Here's what they're really good at. Understanding the oral law and how you must obey it, not them, but you must obey it. How to not worry what the Word of God says that much as long as we look good and look religious. And here's the other thing. They could find the loopholes in the written law. How many of you would love, and I do, IRS 
tax code loopholes. Because they're there because we can jump through them. We're allowed to do those things. A church had a fight a few months ago about this thing. Can a church do this? Is it in the IRS code? No, it's not. A church can do that because it doesn't come under that code. And the person that was bringing it up to the church was saying, oh, you're going to lose your 501 and da-da-da. There are loopholes, and we're allowed to use them. Not just churches, but personally, we all do. And if you don't and you think it's ungodly, that's wrong. But here's the important thing, okay? He says to them, verse 5, But you say, whoever shall say to his father or mother, anything of mine you might have been helped by has been given to God. How holy does that sound? Doesn't that sound great? Anything that would have helped my dear parents has been given to God. Now remember, here's what Jesus had said to them, and we'll say to them later. You're a bunch of whitewashed tombs. The outside looked really good. The inside's full of what? What's in a tomb? Dead men's bones. That means inside they're all dead spiritually. Outside they look really good. Everybody say, man, I wish I could be like a Pharisee. They're so religious. Yes, they are. But that doesn't get you to heaven. That doesn't get you in a right relationship with God. It's interesting. In verse 5, the word given is not a verb. And here's where the King James does a much better job at dealing with this. It's, it basically says, a gift by whatsoever you might us have profited. It basically says, it's a gift. Here's the idea. The word Dorian or Doran is the word gift and primarily used for something given to God. You're giving it to God. So these people are basically saying in today's terminology, they said, I would have helped my folks, but I have set everything aside so I can have it for the Lord. So my 401k, my savings, my extra car, they're all for God's use, not for my parents' use, because I've set them aside. I've earmarked it for God, even though it's still in my humble hands. Mark uses the word, same passage idea, Mark uses the word korban, and the text kind of explains it, that it in Mark 7-11, it says, given to God, same as Matthew's text, but it uses korban, which is a, he basically a Hebrew word, and this is an expression used of di a direct offering to God. They've offered, listen, they've kind of brought their, remember, anybody remember passbook savings? It looked like a passport, uh, uh, passport, um, what? Yes. You get this thing, and they put it in a machine, and you deposited your 10 bucks, and you carry it around. And all you have to do is say, this is God's. My name's on it, but this is God's, and I can't use it for anybody but me. Kind of get what I'm saying? But it's, a, but it's an expression that's used, this word korban, is an expression in the technical sense of dedicating or offering something to the use in the temple to bring it to the Lord's temple to use it there. Or merely declare a korban, and then it can technically be set aside for temple use. It was meant for a good purpose, but they twisted it enough for a loophole. How evil were these people? Mom and dad need help. They korban their camel. They say, my camel's korban. Can't use it. Dedicated to God. Walk. Parents, let me give you a few Old Testament examples of what this idea is. Go to Leviticus chapter 1. And I want you to understand, in this paradigm, the Korban's always connected to God, not to using something as a loophole so your parents can't have it. Verse 2, Leviticus 1, verse 2 says, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of you brings a Korban, an offering to the Lord, you shall bring the, your Korban of animals 
from the herd of the, of the flock. In other words, it's an offering. You're giving it to who? It's a gift to God. Nothing else is involved in that idea. Look at chapter 27, just to keep everything intact, because from one end to the other kind of idea. Leviticus 27, 11. If, however, it is unclean animal of a kind which men do not present as an offering, men don't present something worthless to God. It's a gift to God. Why would you give God a gift and say, well, this is a broken jalopy. It doesn't run, but you can have it. How nice is that? Anybody ever give you something and say you can have it, it's broken, and you've got to fix it? Say, that's not helping me. Why didn't you throw it away? Somebody, de- somebody gave our church and homestead a, grand, a, a, not a, a baby grand piano, gave it to us. We paid to have it brought into church. The guy took one look at it, which I, sh- this is stupid because I was young. He says, free. We'll take it. The guy looked at it and says, this is irreparable. This is a piece of junk. I can't do anything with it. It was previously probably a $25,000 piano, but they didn't take care of it, and it was a piece of junk. You know what I did? I had to throw it away. I took an ax to the thing. I got batting practice in. And all I'm saying to myself is, I'm disposing of somebody else's garbage, and it cost me 200 bucks. You wouldn't do that to God. Here's his nerve. The person called me a week later. Can I get a letter that I donated to the church? I go, if you give me me $400 back, we're going to negotiate this. Because if you want a letter, it already cost me 200. I got to cover that. You understand what I'm saying? We don't give trash to God. We give our best to God. That's what he's saying here. It goes on. He says, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. Right? Get the right animal for the right animal for the right purpose to give it to God, and it's holy. What the Pharisees were doing was declaring something holy because they said it was. Therefore, it couldn't be used for his parents. Now, here's the interesting thing. Okay, go back to Matthew 15. Here's the interesting thing. Nowhere is there proof the disciples did or did not wash their hands. I'm going to lean to the side they didn't wash their hands. I'm okay with that. Okay? You all all good with that? Because we may have something, and we'll tell all the kids that, you know, we have a potluck lunch. Say, go wash your hands. I always hear the parents saying, go wash your hands. Don't take this wrong because I see everything. I don't very seldomly see all the parents go with the kids and wash their hands. You're all guilty, okay? And all of you didn't laugh and know because I've been there, okay? It was fun when the kids, my grandkids were little because I go in and wash their hands and I get mine done at the same time. Now I say go in and wash your hands. I don't always say that. Because we figure kids are what? Dirtier than we are. They're crud. They got to get that stuff off, okay? But I want you to understand, here's where they're at. Basically, they took a word used for an offering or sacrifice and and something that would be dedicated to the use of the temple for worship and said that over their stuff so that they would now have no obligation to their parents. Do you realize how evil that is? Do you realize how evil that is? And that's what Jesus is addressing. The very evilness of what they were doing was so much more elevated than washing your hands. So basically we have this Two condemnations that are that are here that we've looked at, that, that's part of this. They were transgressing the law. They were changing, that they found a loophole. They were changing things and the use of the proper biblical use of something so they could use it for their stuff. Here's a third condemnation. Ready for this? They invalidated the Word of God. By doing what they did, they said the Word of God doesn't mean anything. They took their tradition and what they figured the loophole was, and thereby saying the word of God is useless. It doesn't mean anything. And the Greek text, this is super strong, where it, where it, 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 as it says this here, that they invalidated the word of God. See, verse 6 says this, and it, let's kind of read it together. It is not to honor his mother and father, and thus you definitely did not honor and invalidated the word of God for this because of your tradition. There's a double negative here in Greek that we, we never see in the English. And most of us will say, nobody should use a double negative, 
right? How many of you have been taught don't use a double negative? Yet Greek uses a double negative to make it super emphatic. No way, no how does the word of God mean anything to you. You've told, made, it, told, made it totally useless. Thereby never, ever honoring your mother and father. That means whatever you did that you said was good and put it aside and didn't use it for your parents, you basically weren't honoring your mother and father. And what's the penalty for not honoring your mother and father? Jesus is condemning them to the same thing they're trying to find a loophole to put him to death. He's already condemned them to a sentence of death. Now, when God Almighty in human flesh says you are condemned, that's not just an immediate death. That's an eternal death. He knew exactly where they were spiritually, and he had set them aside to say, you're eternally damned. That's how evil you guys are. This word here for invalidate is used three times in the Bible. It's both in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, those two parallel passages, and also in Galatians 3.17. So let's go to Galatians 3.17. And gleam a little something out of the other usage of this word that Paul carries over to Galatians. And just a little commercial starting in August on Wednesday nights, we'll be studying Galatians on Wednesday nights. So that's where we're headed. And notice how Paul uses this word, same word translated the same way. He says, I, what I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The, when the law came, the Mosaic law, it didn't make void or nullify, that's a good word, nullify the covenant God made. The covenant God made with the nation of Israel still goes on. Law doesn't change anything. That's what Paul's saying. Didn't void it. So, but by their words, by the Pharisees' words and actions, they've made the very word of God, the very law of God, or in this case, these Ten Commandments, and you break one, you've broken them all, these Ten Commandments, and all possible variations of the word of God, they voided God's word, they annulled God's word because a loophole that they were using as a noose. Now, that's, a, that's kind of important, because I'm going to say something. I have never cared for what anybody thinks about the Word of God. I don't care. I don't care what you think about it. I don't care what I think about it. I want to know what God's Word says. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think it's so important. I don't go to the Word of God and say, what is it saying to me? If you go to the Word of God and say, I want an application. I want to know what it says to me. You're at the wrong angle. You want to know what it says. You want to get clarity of what it's saying. Because it's the only thing we have from God. This word of this total Bible we call Bible is God talking to us. Now, can we get application? Surely. And sure, we can come out of this and say, this is what was said to the Pharisees. Can we get? But if we're strictly looking for application in, Bible, in the Bible, we're missing the point. I don't know how you can read the begats of Second Chronicles and say, what does that mean to me? Maybe I should be more productive. I should have had 30 kids instead of three. I mean, I, the, the idea behind some of the people's thinking is only certain things will I make application. The rest I don't care about. That's wrong. I want to know what all of God's Word says to who it says it to. You understand? Because otherwise, we're going to come out with a place that's evil. And what the Pharisees said is they had no regard for God's Word. They just wanted to know how they can do things and live in a way that they felt good about themselves. So here's what Jesus says in Matthew 15. He gives them another, this is the fourth condemnation, he says. First of all, they've already invalidated the word of God. They don't care about it, okay? They've already transgressed God's commandments, didn't care about it. And then Jesus says something, I don't think many of you like this word. Because we said, How could I ever use this word for somebody else? Can I walk up to somebody and say, you hypocrite? That's pretty harsh, isn't it? 
Jesus says, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. The word hypocrites itself means to come under judgment. <laughs> That's what it really means. You know, uh, hupo means under, and krino is, has to do with judging. Here's what a hypocrite was at one point. Ready for this? This is so much fun. Because this is what Jesus, this is directly to them, and here's what he's saying. He's saying, an a hypocrite was an individual who answers and replies on stage. It can depict the interpreter or expounder who explained the drama to the audience. So think of somebody off stage. We used to call it, we call them later the narrator, and would tell you what's happening on stage. That's how those dramas in the Greek plays usually occurred, where somebody was doing something on stage and somebody off stage was giving the understanding of what's going on. Okay? This individual later would end up wearing a mask for whatever he was acting out. So, and this, this actor in the Greek theater is what a hypocrite was. This word in classical Greek never had an uh, unfavorable ethical meaning, yet when the Septuagint for, was formed, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it took on a negative meaning. In Jewish thinking, ready for this? The hypocrite is an ungodly man, and the ungodly man was a hypocrite. Period. That's where we're at right here. Jesus is under Jewish thinking. So, the, so because of this, it came from the Jewish dislike of the pagan Greek theater that associated actors as lying and deceptive. So put all this together. When Jesus says, you hypocrites, what's he saying? He said to the scribes and Pharisees, they're just play actors on the stage of life. They're lying. They're deceptive. They're de they're." I don't have a care for God's word, and they're just putting on a facade. You hypocrites. Now, I don't know if many of you realize this, and I'm not trying to say this in a, in a dissing fashion. Jesus wasn't nice. He was truthful. How would you have said that in a truthful, nice way? And some of you would have sugarcoated it because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And surely most of us don't want to walk up to somebody and say, you hypocrite. But Jesus said it right to them because he knew what was going on. In Mark's account in chapter 6, verse 32, Mark alludes that those in the, in the feeding of the 5,000, and probably uh, a Peterism here, that the great multitude had, uh, they were sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So what's happening is this, these Pharisees come into this thing and they pervert God's law. And, P, and Jesus says to them, you're hypocrites because you pervert God's law. And they, they used external religiosity in an attempt to conceal their inner corruption. We'll see that. This is what's inside of them. This is who they really are. So let's get condemnation number five. Verse 8 says this. Well, let's read 7 and 8. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. So Jesus is going to use what? Scripture. And say, Scripture is talking about you guys. This is called application, if you don't know that. I don't think they knew that. And I don't think it just applies directly to them. But at this time, so you know where we're at, the Pharisees represented the nation. The nation of Israel had not come to Jesus as their Messiah. They had not followed him as their Messiah. They didn't care. And by rejecting him, the Pharisees set the stage for what would happen to Jesus. They were the representatives of that. Later, John will pick up this phraseology. John will just say the Jews. And everybody thinks all the Jews were doing that. No, the Jews were the leadership of Israel. John was just using it as a title. So this Jewish leadership had set the stage, and what they had done was, they, and it's an age-old sin. It's not a new sin. They had given God lip service. Here's what it says in verse 8. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. I find that fascinating. Jesus just deals with what came out of the mouth. They're talking about God. They're honoring God. 
They're saying things about, you know, verse verse 2 says, you you break broke our tradition. And remember, tradition here you can put in oral law. That was their oral law. You've broken that law. And he says, you've given me the lip service, but where did it come from? Now, most of you say heart. If anybody in this room thinks with your heart, let her see me. Because nobody in this room ever thinks with the heart. The heart is an organ that pumps blood, hopefully, to your feet and up to your head. And that's all it does all day long is pump blood. It doesn't think. But in Hebrew, it's called the leb, L-E-B. And the leb is the thinking part, your guts, who you are, your very thoughts. So when it says hearts, what's coming, what's inside you, okay? They would say different things that would outwardly honor God, but their heart wasn't in it. Let's look at this and go to Isaiah 29. Isaiah chapter 29. Now let me kind of give you a picture of what's happening here in Isaiah 29. Isaiah's Isaiah's ministry is a very strange ministry. He served for about 50 years through a bunch of different uh, kings of Israel. So he served for a long time. And as he served, though, he kept giving out prophecies of how Israel was condemned. This is way before the Babylonian captivity, probably 7, 710 B.C. And he's telling them all the sins of that nation that will lead the southern kingdom into captivity. You need to stop this. That's what Isaiah is saying. Otherwise, you're going to follow just like the northern kingdom into captivity that just happened probably during Isaiah's ministry. Okay? And then one of, this is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible because it begins in verse 1. Woe, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped. Ariel, ready for this, is my middle name in Hebrew. Okay? It means lion of God. So does Eric. <laughs> And what is, what, what's being used here and why it says it's only used four times in the whole Bible and three just in this chapter. And why is he using this? Because it's a very colorful way of saying Jerusalem. Okay? And he's warning them, and maybe you can even say this is kind of their judgmental name. You were the line of God as a nation, but you aren't any longer. And judgment is coming. Look at verse 2. And I will bring distress to Ariel, and she shall be a city of lamenting and mourning, and she shall be like an Ariel to me. And I will camp against you, encircling you, and I will set my siege works against you, and I will raise up battle towers against you. And then, then you shall be brought low. From the earth you shall speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate. Your word shall come, your voice shall be like, that of the spirit of the ground, and your speech shall whisper from the dust. So there's very judgmental. And then he says in verse 9, there's going to be judicial blindness cast upon this nation. Be delayed and walk. Blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. Because of what you've done, I'm putting you in a spiritual coma. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your head, the seers. In other words, you're not going to hear the prophets. You're not going to understand what the seers' vision for what's happening. And the entire vision shall be like the words of a sealed book. In other words, you should you'll look at the Bible and say, I don't get any of this. Ever heard anybody say that? which they give it to one who is, Ill, who is literate, saying, please read this, and he will say, I cannot read it for it's sealed. No one can get it. Know what that tells me? Spend time reading God's Word. Because otherwise, you're going to be spiritually blinded. But here's where this verse kicks in. Ready? This is a verse Jesus quotes. So it's not in an environment that he just pulls this verse out of random you know, air and said, let's Here's where you guys are at. They're under judgment. Because what have they done? They can't see the book. They've sealed the book. They don't care about the book. What do they care about? Tradition. Tradition. Right? 
And he says in verse 13, Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Wow, who would have thought God knew what would happen with the Pharisees? <laughs> right? Who would have thunk that? Jesus says, this is about you. This isn't nice. This is condemning. Look at verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be concealed. So there's a time coming for the nation of Israel. God will move in miraculous and, and wonderful ways. But until then, there's going to be a lot of dumb people ruling that are religious, that claim they have a, a word from God. I was reading something last night to my wife, and I said, that's kind of condemning. You know, somebody claims to be an apostle today. There's no such thing. They're a false teacher. Just think about it for a minute. Wow, how condemning is that? Has anybody heard of an apostle lately? Just apply that. So why I'm saying that is because here's what you have. You have a group of people that are very religious, but they're not discerning the Word of God at any point. They don't get it. So we got to say, is there a spiritual blindness from the time of Isaiah to that nation? Yes. Was that nation at the time of Christ in spiritual blindness? Yes, I think we've delineated that multiple times. Is the leadership of Israel, the religious side of Israel, are they in spiritual blindness? Yes. And isn't that problematic? Because how would they see their Messiah as long as they remained in spiritual blindness and all they had to do was spend time in the Word of God, not in oral traditions? Because why? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by oral traditions. Never. Never. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And if you don't spend time in it, and this is, this is application. Your faith won't grow. Don't spend time reading our daily bread and commentaries and all that stuff. Be careful. I'm not, not knocking any of them. I'm just saying people spend a lot of time there, but spend little time in a word. Spend time in a word. We want to exegete. We want to get what it says out to us. You all with me? Isn't that important? So condemnation number six. Verse nine. Matthew, go back to Matthew 15, verse 9. Now, I think of these, these words that Jesus uses here in chapter 15 as like nails in their coffin. And every time I go through one, I kind of hear just... You understand what I'm saying? So the sixth one really pounds the coffin closed. Verse 9 says, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. You want application for today? Take that apart. Because this is ongoing today and confusing people by the masses. I was talking to a young man the other day. I go, you want assurance of salvation? Here's the words of assurance. You ready for this? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will, and you definitely have eternal life. Is that so hard to understand? What's your salvation based upon? You're allowed to say something. This is where we kind of interact a little bit. Your salvation is based on Christ alone. How come I never hear that? When somebody wants to teach assurance, I'll say, here's the five ways you can tell if you're saved. My five ways is Jesus did it, Jesus did it, Jesus did it, Jesus did it. I wasn't here, Jesus did it. Are you assured of your salvation yet? Well, you don't know what I do. Jesus did it, Jesus did it. You just keep doing this. We could go in a circle all day long because if your assurance is ever based on you, you have no assurance. Know what you have? Doubt. I have a mirror at home too. You understand what I'm trying to say? And people want to do these things to the Word of God. It's horrible what they do. And they want to teach things that men say, because men say things real majestically, but are wrong. Well, you could test your faith. You could test to see if you're saved. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. How hard is this? Do you understand what I'm saying? 
Well, that's easy to believe it. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. I don't care what you want to call it. There's nothing we could do to get a foothold in our salvation, to do something for Christ. We come by faith alone, to Christ alone, because it's called grace alone. Yes? Can I have one amen? <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is because every time I hear something from somebody saying, we can give you assurance of salvation, I want to write down, I think I'm not saved. Because they're looking at me. And Christ did it for me, not with me. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And it's so important for you to understand that Christ did it for you. It's personal, but not with you. And I don't know what else to do with that, because here's what's happened. We've developed a pattern of worship today that's called vain worship because man wants to do what man thinks is right. Now, I, I know sometimes we do things here kind of weird, too. I understand because I think we just go along with the flow. And somebody will always say, well, the 1045 hour is worship service. No, it's not. No, it's not. We're singing songs. That's all we're doing. Is it, we should be worshiping when we, right now, we're opening the word of God. We're worshiping. Do you understand? And some people say, well, worship service is when the band's really loud and the choir sings the same repetitious line 4,000 times till somebody walks the aisle kind of thing. They were doing things, and here's what it literally reads in this verse 9. I want to give you the literal reading. It's kind of funny. Teachings, teachings, injunctions of men, I didn't stutter. It says teachings twice. Teachings, so we say teaching as teaching, injunctions of men, precepts of men, which are the core teachings, as they say they worship God, this is what the Bible says. Let me tell you what it says. You understand? They're not telling you what it says. They're walked away from God's word. And they're teaching what they think it might say or what sells for congregational services today as the word of God. And they think that's worship. It is not worship. And it's, it saddens me so much to see when people say, and here's what Jesus is saying. He's taking this right out of the Old Testament. This idea of vain worship. People could do things because they can't do it right all the time or it's too repetitious for them or whatever. Well, let's just do it this way. No, God, God said, and this is so simple, I can only be approached one way. One way. We only approach God today through Jesus Christ. No other way. Well, you know, I got to be baptized. The Bible says I got to be. Now, first of all, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can because some of you may want to stone me when I'm done. Make sure it's smooth rocks. I like those kind. There's not a verse in the whole Bible that says you have to be baptized to be saved. Not one. But it's sold every time I see something is if you're not baptized, either you're not saved or you haven't done your second step of obedience, therefore you might not be saved. i never seen so many pickled Christians that people come up with. That's not in the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Read your Bible and see what God wants. God wants you to what? Believe in Jesus and you have eternal life. There was no other additions to that if there is it's not it's not what we see is biblical salvation i know it sounds preachy but it, it annoys me when people make the bible say something it doesn't they say well you got to see it always says baptism assume this people that says baptisms are always in water that they're illiterate biblically just assume that just assume that cuz i'm saying there's at least seven or eight baptisms so if somebody walks up to me and says, you need to be baptized to be saved, I say, by fire? That'll rattle some cages. Because there's a baptism of fire coming. It's called judgment. Right? You all know that, right? Right? I don't want to go to that one. I want to be a spectator to that sporting event. Right? But there is a baptism of fire. There's a baptism, listen, of Moses. On dry land, 
know who really got baptized the Baptist way? The Egyptians. They went under, they were immersed, and they stayed there. So define, ter- and the reason I'm saying that is because so many false doctrines are coming out because people think they're worshiping a God of their own creation, and they don't realize it. We want to be biblical. What does God say? Now, I'm not nogging it. If you always want to get baptized after salvation at some point, I can understand that. But if you don't, you're fine. You're fine. I'm not going to stand up here and condemn you. God's not going to use you if you're not baptized. Because then I have a problem. Is it backwards, forwards, up and down, splashing, sprinkling, shoving water? I mean, what is it? What is it? Because we know water was involved in water baptism, right? But what kind? Is it holy water, not so holy water? Is it the canal? Is it the pool? Is it the lake? Is it salt water? And I think it has to do with what you want to do and what you're trying to accomplish publicly. That's all. Tradition! (laughs) That's a good one. Okay? But let's remain as biblical as we can. Because to worship God properly, he wants us to be people of the book, not people of people's words. I've ta- I talked to a young man a few months ago, and I kept dropping was one guy's name. So-and-so said this. So-and-so said this. So-and-so. Oh, what did your Bible say? Have you actually opened it up and said, God say it? No, he's got to be. He's a good teacher. He's been around for years. So what? There's been a lot of people around for, for years doing different things, and some of them are pretty useless. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Praise God. God's given us in people that can't do certain things, you know. How many of you ever went gone to the grocery store and let somebody bag your groceries? How many of you come home and say, I can't believe you put the bread on the bottom? Are you serious you put the bread on the bottom? Because you're just going. Chow, chow, chow. We were taught when we were younger, certain things went in and was like OCD arrangement of putting bagging your groceries, you know? If you bag your own groceries and put your bread on the bottom, you should be beaten. <laughs> but think about it for a minute. Think about this for a moment as we go through this. How many churches are trying to worship the God of the Bible or the God of their making? There's your application. Because Jesus condemned the Pharisees, drove in that last nail into the coffin and said, we're done. And when we go to the next part of this chapter, it says, and after he called, verse 10 says, and after he called the multitude to him, he said, hear and understand. This isn't even in order. It's just like, what just happened? So next week, we're going to pick up with this. I'm going to give you an outline for the rest of 15. Prayerfully, we'll get done with 15, the rest of chapter 15 next week. We have, the, we, we have in this section, verses 10 through 20, we have the response of Jesus to the multitude. So the multitude forms again in this area of Gennesaret that he deals with, and he's going to diagnose the problem with man. So he's going to, have, he's going to uh, respond to the multitudes. The disciples will respond to him. He respond, Jesus will respond back to the disciples, and then Peter will respond to Jesus, and Jesus responds to Peter who res- and the disciples. That's basically 10 through 20. Then we're going to look at Jesus now makes a launch. He's kind of done with a lot of Jewish people. He's going to launch and go to a Gentile and go into a Gentile region. He's going to go to Tyre and Sidon, and the first thing he should say is, why? Because he said what? I'm going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I don't think he's going to find many Jewish people in Tyre and Sidon. And I think part of it was he was just, he needed to get away from them and this antagonism. And he knew the Pharisees wouldn't follow him there because Jewish people didn't want to go in Gentile areas. It's a good way to keep the people from chasing him for a little bit because he's heading, listen, he's heading to Jerusalem, but he's going to Gennesaret. He's going north instead of south. (laughs) So he just needs a respite. And then he's going to feed the 4,000, and the feeding of the 4,000 is a Gentile crowd. And I think some of the disciples probably were saying to themselves, let him starve. <laughs> but you're going to see the, such compassion that Jesus has, not only this, to the Canaanite woman, but to the crowds, as he not only deals with the Canaanite woman and her sick daughter and the crowds. And that's what we're going to uh, deal with as we get there. And then we're going to go to chapter 16. And guess who's back on the scene? Oh, let me tell you this. From, from when, when Jesus is diagnosing the heart of man, I really think the Pharisees were like off the scene. They had just done, we're done. We've been condemned. We don't want to like have this interaction anymore. So from 15 verse 10 all the way to the end of the chapter, there's not a Pharisee or scribe in sight. It's like, 
You got a five minute break, and then all of a sudden you open up 16, and the Pharisees and Sadducees came up. What just happened? Now, let me tell you what happened real quick. The Pharisees went off, and now they said, you know, we got a common enemy, Sadducees. Let's join together and go get Jesus. So these were two enemies that had a common enemy that went together to go get Jesus. Don't miss this. And they were going to do what? Notice what it says in chapter 16, verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, testing him, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. If I was, but I'm not, Jesus, I would have gave him a sign from heaven. All you needed was strategic strikes of lightning bolts. <laughs> we're done with this conversation, and everybody would know, don't mess with that guy. But Jesus gives them, again, a wonderful lesson. And that's what we're going to look at. Not next week. We're going to deal with, again, uh, chapter 15. Let's pray. Let's do this. Let's stand so you guys can get blood flow back to your legs. And we'll stand and pray and dismiss. And I know some of you are following up and going to Kai's. you got about an hour to have lunch and do whatever. So uh, and hope you have a great time. So, Father, thank you again for this wonderful time we've had together in your word. A time of blessing to see that your son dealt with direct antagonism, that uh, these people were trying to get him to uh, die and, and put, be put to death and destroyed way before his time. And we, I am so thankful today that your father who protected your son for the perfect time, that he would go to the cross, die for the sins of the world, and that today we could stand today, that all we have to do is have faith in your son's work alone. That's called grace. And Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace, and you may be dismissed.